So now we're going to spend some more time on rotational aspects of three-dimensional imaging. Now this is something uh, that is, uh, forms the basis of all R-wave gated acquisition and even uh, more so for the volumetric R-wave gated acquisition which is possible and we do it every day on the current uh, av available, currently available three-dimensional volumetric TE probes. For this specific rotational three-dimensional imaging, we needed to have the highest levels of, uh, you know, spatial and temporal synchronization and a, a good deal of knowledge about image optimization, nabology, and had to go through a very complicated workflow to acquire a three-dimensional image. And as we will go and see why it was so important and what is the advantage of knowing this, this principle and spending more time, it's understanding its basis to facilitate our understanding of current volumetric three-dimensional imaging. So going to the next slide, so this was the system that was more commonly used for rotational three-dimensional imaging. That's the Siemens Sequoia's C512 system. In its own right, it was a, a phenomenal 2D system. It had a V6M probe that did two-dimensional imaging and wasn't capable of rotational three-dimensional imaging unless it was coupled with this a TomTech computer. Uh, this TomTech computer, while could be incorporated in any two-dimensional system, but was most compatible uh, with the Siemens uh, Sequoia C512 system. And what it allowed us to do was to acquire images at every three or five degree increments of the scan plane rotation, hold them in the memory of the system, and then finally put them together by spatially and temporally synchronizing them over the couple of minutes to produce a a reconstructed image, which was not exactly a live image, but was a reconstructed image. So if you look at the, the system as such, as you can see, the probe was behind the heart and the scan plane rotated at three to five degrees. We're gonna spend some more time on the animations demonstrating how the scan plane rotated. And in essence, if I move over a little bit, you can see that the scan plane essentially rotated here from zero to five degrees rotation in and around the middle axis of the TE probe. Now we'll take a greater look at it as, as, we, as we look at other things now. So while the system is not available anymore, I just wanted to see how is it really used at some, some clinically or not, and lo and behold, I found it on eBay, but this time only for $2,500, and we essentially paid about $275,000 back in 2006 for this system. Now the good news is that it comes loaded with all the bells and whistles which will allow anyone who tends to buy the system to do rotational three-dimensional imaging. It is for $2,500 and there's $400 of delivery fee, but for those of hardcore three-dimensional imaging enthusiasts, this thing is available to learn and to practice rotational three-dimensional imaging. So looking at the, you know, the scan plane, the red is the reference plane, that's where we always started. So by default, imaging started at about zero degrees rotation of the scan plane. And as you can see, that the, the rotation occurred from zero to 180 degrees in complete, complete you know, uh, circle. But this didn't happen so quickly, and it wasn't really a complete 360 degree rotation, as I will show in the next one. This is purely for, a, for the level of concept. You know. So now you can see in this one, in this animation, the scan plane is rotating every five degrees. So now for a patient with a heart rate of about, say, 70 if you're doing you know five degree cuts so that would make it you know somewhere around 36 cuts so about 36 seconds and then putting it together and but the, you can see that the complex structure of a heart was just made up of 36 sections and the rest had to be interpolated now you could go at three degree increments also uh, which would make about 60 cuts there would be less interpolation but more time required to not only acquire those images but also to putting them together and finally creating an image that was you know, displayed on the screen. So the, the trade-off of a higher quality image was that it took longer to acquire and it took longer to put it together. So that was the key part of it. And in the next animation, as you can see, that I am actually putting together a, a series of slices which are being acquired with every scan plane rotation at every five degree increment. Now, as they're acquired, you see that they are spatially synchronized, which means the probe while, you know, while the images were being acquired was kept at the same place. And you can see by the position of the leaflets of the intracardiac valves that they are all at the same time. So therefore, they were spatially synchronized and temporally synchronized. Therefore, the image quality was pretty decent 
and we could have a gorgeous image being displayed as I'll show you in the next few slides when we look at these images. So, but the most important thing to recognize over here is that at a regular RR wave interval or a normal sinus rhythm was an absolute requirement for this form of imaging. But as you can see, that because of the number of uh, frames in between two adjacent R waves had to be absolutely equal so that they could be put together. If one interval had more or less frames than the other, you would end up having temporal uh, dyssynchrony. And in addition to being, you know, you have to keep the probe still, not let the patient move, not let somebody touch the patient, and, and at the same time acquire images over a minute or so with regular heart rate. So there was a lot of ifs that had to be you know, it had to be satisfied. A lot of things had to happen at the same time for this thing to, to produce a good three-dimensional image. Like I'll show you in the next slide. As you can see in this one, that there's a, in this upper section, the, you know, the region of interest is identified. That is the mitral valve. And once you identify the region of interest, next is of initiation of three-dimensional volumetric data, which consists of not only identifying but also, you know, identifying the R waves on the EKG signal that is being given to the machine. So it was not just important to display the EKG, but the computer had to be told to recognize the R waves. And how you found out that when you started to have, you know, these yellow uh, spikes on these R waves, which implied that not only is the computer importing the EKG signal from the monitor, but is also beginning to recognize the, the R waves on the EKG signal. So there were, therefore, a lot of things broke, could break down at any moment in time. And if somebody didn't really know that you had to activate the recognition of R waves, the entire operation could fail on simply not pressing one button. Now I will show you in real time how this thing happens. So imagine, so this is the mitral valve, and I've deliberately zoomed on the angle to see when it, it's activated and how the angle changes from zero to 180 degrees. This is uh, the mitral valve reconstruction on an actual image. And with the change on the, on, the, on the bottom panel, you can see that a lot of buttons are being pressed. So I've, I've initiated volumetric imaging. You'll see a box around the mitral valve. That's the region of interest. Then I'll go over to activate the heart rate. And once I've activated the heart rate and the machine begins to recognize the R waves, you will be seeing a change in the scan plane that rotates from 5, 10, 15, 25. And at the same time, there is a change in the in the shape of the mitral valve because you are acquiring a separate section. It goes from 0 to 45 to 90 to eventually 135 degrees. And that's where the acquisition will stop. And finally, the, all the images that are held in the, in the memory of this machine are finally put together. And therefore, you start to put, put, put it together. Now, when you got the image, it was actually a pretty decent image. And to the point that you not only were able to, you know, display this thing in an anatomical format, but the machine using, you know, landmark techniques and the earliest form of art artificial intelligence was able to label the valve based on, you know, the aortic valve, the left atrial appendage, A1, A2, and A3, P1, P2, and P3. And these were, you know, incredible earliest uh, forms of three-dimensional imaging using the earliest form of artificial intelligence because it based on the recognition of landmarks. It was so it was great images once you got them, but you can see that they're a little, uh, you know, smooth and they're not as, uh, you know, sharp as you know, because there is a lot of interpolation that has gone into, into these images. So now, besides, you know, getting in an on fast view of the aortic valve at, uh, or the mitral valve, you could also look at uh, 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 LV aspect of the mitral valve at this, uh, like we are used to doing that. But again, this was not a live image. It was uh, a reconstructed image uh, acquired after a, a lot of time, about two, three minutes to do that. You, know. you could also incorporate grayscale information into it as well as color flow Doppler information like it. In this patient, you can see there's a retracted posterior leaflet and there's a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation jet. So the image is of a pretty decent quality, but again, there was a lot of steps that had to be completed before you go on and do uh, display this image for clinical interpretation. However, one of the greatest strengths of this system was the ability to manipulate the grayscale and the color flow Doppler information separately. For example, up in this example, you can see there's a mitral regurgitation jet that is coming centrally. However, in the low bottom one, we are using this um, 
They're maintaining the grayscale, but we are cropping down the color flow information down to its the basis of the basis of mitral valve to demonstrate that this is a that the jet is coming from a particular location of the mitral valve. So for really high-end interpretations of the of the site of mitral regurgitation, quantification, uh, and if you're lucky the patient had normal sinus rhythm, you could essentially go and do a very high quality, you know, image uh, the reconstruction and interpretation in these patients. There was also, you know, multiple other pathologies that we diagnosed. You can see a paravalvular leak in this patient, as well as two regurgitation jets in this and a paravalvular leak in this one. Similarly, a P2 uh, regurgitation jet coming centrally, and this is another two regurgitation jets coming from P1 and, and uh, P3 location. So provided, the, as I said, the patient was in sinus rhythm, you could get gorgeous images. But the greatest uh, advantage of this situation was not the fact that it gave us good images, but it introduced us for the first time for quantitative imaging of intracardiac valves. So this is the, the first uh, you know, uh, um, uh, generation uh, mitral valve quantification package where when you went ahead and you know, identified certain landmarks, then based on those identification of landmarks and the coaptation zone by the, uh, by the operator, you could do a lot of good things like looking at the, uh, you know, the non-planarity angle, the mitral valve annular diameters, uh, you know, the, the leaflet coaptation zones and the degree of retraction and tenting heights and tenting volumes could be looked at also. However, if you were not particular in acquiring those images and you looked at the respiratory motion or probe motion, it should show up as a stitch artifact when two, two successive slices were not spatially synchronized. And if you were not to suspend ventilation, you can see with the respiratory motion of the heart, there's a certain amount of roughness and grooving that shows up on these images. So this was the biggest problem uh, with the R-wave gated acquisition. Now the pros and cons are the spatial alignment was simple to achieve. All you got to do is hold the probe still, don't let anyone touch the patient or move the patient, suspend ventilation, and no T probe motion. The temporal alignment, on the other hand, was pretty complicated, and that's it has to not only patient being in sinus rhythm, but you also had to do a lot of things, like I said in the beginning, to be able to, if you look at these, if you were able to, you know, the ultrasound machine not only has to, you know, acquire the signal into the system, but also has to recognize the, the R wave. So it required, involved pressing a lot of buttons in rapid succession in a particular sequence for these images to be, you know, displayed the way, the way they are displayed, you know. So it was a clunky system and EKG gating was the most important problem with this one. So to put it all together, the rotational three-dimensional acquisition consists of probe behind the heart, the, pace, the probe moving from zero to 180 degrees, and eventually the images that you get, like we talked about in the beginning, that you went ahead and you were to able to, uh, you know, stack them together, spatially and temporally synchronize them, and eventually once you get them together, you would have a decent interpretable image. So this is so our wave gated acquisition is an absolute essential for temporal synchronization. Lack of probe and patient motion is the second absolute essential, but you could do it, but it wasn't that gorgeous an image that showed up there. And therefore, this, these were the few you know, uh, prerequisites of this kind of imaging. Now the stitch artifact, that is, we talked a lot about the uh, probe motion, uh, so, sorry, temporal synchronization. Let's talk about this, the spatial synchronization. For example, this is like a one, panoramic shot that I took on the beach with a camera by taking multiple small scans uh, at the same time while keeping the camera still. Now at the same time, I went ahead and took another picture, but this time I moved my camera every time I took that sp specific scan of the picture. So as a result, as you can see, there's significant spatial misalignment that each you know, part of the picture uh, is being taken with the hand motion leading to a very, you know, ugly kind of image. You can see what it is, but to make a good clinical diagnosis on something like this is, uh, is, is, is difficult. So spatial synchronization, while not as critical, but was almost as important in making a good image for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the mitral valve. So the spatial synchronization involved don't move the T probe or the patient was the bottom line. So suspension of ventilation was another one because that led to the motion of the heart. 
lack of surgical manipulation, which can be very difficult sometimes in critical situations, and also lack of patient motion. The patient doesn't have to be, shouldn't have to be breathing or moving on their own also. So to put it all together, the R wave gated uh, acquisition and, uh, and uh, the temporal synchronization was the most critical part, most difficult to achieve, and the ones that made this R wave gated acquisition impossible in those patients who had arrhythmia. So rightfully so, while it was a gorgeous way of imaging, the critical, the Achilles heel of this, of this uh, system was the R, this normal sinus rhythm. And that was one which led to it's not being practiced widely because of the clunkiness of the approach, the complicated workflow, the number of, um, you know, the number of uh, buttons you had to press to get, get it right, and breaking one step in the workflow led to a, you know, complete image that was completely useless or impossible to achieve, you know. So at the end of the day, this was a good image, but it was, the final word was, it was too much dependent on having, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, workflow to be done in a very specific critical fashion to be done. So therefore, while it was practiced in academic centers, it didn't really catch up that much in the in the in 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 the widespread cardiac anesthesia perioperative perioperative arenas. You know, so therefore, uh, this is one of our review articles on a practical approach to intraoperative three-dimensional echocardiography. All these concepts are, are discussed in greater detail. Uh, not that we've written it, but I'd strongly encourage everyone to you know, go and read this uh, article. This is a great resource for initiation of your uh, practice of th intraoperative uh, three-dimensional echocardiography. Now, we'll move on to the next section. Enjoy.